Hey, welcome to Supercharge Fridays. We are at week 83. And if you're watching live, come in, in the comments and say hello. Don't be shy. And if you're watching on the replay, put hashtag replay so we can say hello to you. We have a lovely guest with us today. And our topic is all about recruiting. What is happening with recruiting? I had a similar session back in February with someone called Jack Kelly, and it was um, very well received. And uh, Jack is a different sort of recruiter, does compliance-related recruiting. And today I have Kelly, who's uh, focused on digital. But at the end of the day, there's lots of similarities, irrespective of location. So the idea today is no matter where you are, come in with your questions. Let us help you out. And I have a bunch of hard-hitting questions that I want to ask um, Kelly. So without further ado, very warm welcome to Supercharge Fridays, Kelly. Lovely to have you. Yeah, so no, thank you so much for having me as well. I'm such a fan of the show. You put such great information out there, and I'm happy to speak with the audience about the misfor misinformation that's floating out there about recruitment and just to yes. answer any questions just about the industry and what is going on and share some interesting stories too. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. And you call this a show, that's like a nice way of putting it. <laughs> it's a live broadcast. We're going to have a lot of fun. So Kelly, uh, for anyone who's like watching and is not familiar with you or your work, give us a little bit of a backstory about what you do today and how you got here. Absolutely. So background, I've been in staffing for 15 years, worked with a small boutique agency in the Baltimore area uh, for about eight years, more in tech. And Eventually had some personal situations come about at home, took a year off, and then, actually, it's funny, it was about six years ago today, launched NAC Digital. And so- Today? Oh, Wednesday. What is today? Friday? <laughs> so Happy anniversary. Oh, wow. Thank you. I know. It's been great. We, I've been, so for six years, have been still working in the same particular niche, um, serving primarily the DC, Northern Virginia and Baltimore area, uh, helping companies, business leaders to scale their digital marketing and technology teams. And what I, um, I feel like I'm uh, interrogating you. What's one thing you love about your job and what's one thing you absolutely hate about it? Oh, no, absolutely. It's funny because actually prior to recruitment and it's, you know, it's funny who, grows up wanting to be a recruiter. Um, <laughs> nobody really writes it down on your list. You kind of stumble into it. So um, I got into it and originally it was always just seemed so interesting to me that, you know, you match people with jobs. It's, it's so interesting. It's fun. I literally, that was the word that came to mind. And honestly, it is. It's everything for me. I need something different every day and having conversations and just hearing about people's professional journeys is so interesting to me. So there's never a dull moment. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, you are, when everything goes perfect and we find a good match, that you are helping people in their career oh, yeah. growth and guidance. So that is so rewarding. Um, oh, yeah. And and what is it that you like less? It's It's been hard recently. It's hard to hear on both sides, particularly on the candidate side over the past year, just the frustrations that they're feeling of not making progress and you know, almost being a counselor and, and listening to everybody and helping provide advice. I wish I could help everyone, contrary to belief. So that's really hard is not having that control. And I think that the candidates do feel that side too. Oh yeah. And and it affects you. You're human. There's no way it cannot can not affect right. you. So uh, I totally get that. Fabulous. So we're going to get into the questions. I see a lot okay. of comments here from people talking about rain and it's, I think, raining. Is it raining where you are as well? I forgot to say yes. uh, it's early morning for <laughs> Kelly. She's in near the DC area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, give her lots of likes because this is like you know, Friday <laughs> morning. The kids are with the husband. She's like really well organized. I so know. appreciate your time. And how's the weather, Kelly, right now? It's been rainy all week, so hopefully it, it clears up a little bit here today. Okay, 
Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So we have lovely comments here from everyone saying happy anniversary. Who grows oh. up saying I want to be a recruiter? But it's one of those things, I guess, um, you kind of fall into. And Eleanor, I really, really hope the uh, session is insightful. Actually, I have no doubt. So we're going to uh, dive in as far as the questions are concerned. And this first question, I also asked Jack back in February, but I love getting different perspectives and okay comparing notes and for anyone who's either looking actively or thinking about going into you know some sort of transition it's important to know the distinction because for from the outside everyone's a recruiter or everyone's in HR and G is watching in in Texas um, there we, we say you know when somebody says they're a doctor the first reaction is oh what kind of medicine do you practice it's the same with hr and it's the same with recruiting so kelly talk to us about the different types of recruiters and who is usually the most helpful type for someone who's in uh, active job seeker yes no absolutely and i'll initially start breaking it down with almost two separate parties so i'll start with you have your corporate in-house recruitment team, and that's going to be with any brand or organization that has their internal team, which is HR. Um, yes. Sometimes depending upon the size of the company, HR could be doing the recruitment too. Typically larger organizations will have talent acquisition team or a recruitment team. There's different titles and you really have to, I think, kind of discuss exactly what their function is within that organization. Um, but they are working for that particular brand and they know that company, they know the yeah. company culture. Um, whereas you have your external and that can look differently. Both are performance-based, uh, meaning yes. commission driven, um, yes. but you have ones that are on and you can break it down into a lot of different areas, but one is going to be retained, um, just meaning they're paid differently. So retained is basically they'll give a, particular percentage of money down and that recruiter is basically all eyeballs on that search. Um, that is their priority to fill that particular position um, where you have contingency where they will not be paid until they hire for that person and the company pays them a, a fee upon completion of that search. So with contingency, it's really speed is the name of the game. Um, the recruiters could be working with a variety of different companies. And I don't want to say the name shop around, but they could be working yeah. with one candidate and essentially sending them to all their clients. Um, so now I don't want to differentiate because I've seen some great contingency recruiters and some great retained recruiters. And then I've seen some not so great. Yeah. <laughs> so, like with every, like with every profession. Exactly. With every position. So yeah. um, I think with that, that you just have to do your due diligence. I think if you're and I'm not working for a big tech company, so I know that there's a lot of these recruiters who can speak on behalf of what's going to be a better process. But I think if you are formulating a target list of companies and some of these big corporations are on your list, reach out to those recruiters. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the misconception is that recruiters don't want to work with you, that we're evil, we're used car salesmen. And I mean, we literally are paid. This is how we earn our living is to find talent for the hiring managers and leaders that we work with. So it's in our best interest to be networking and working with candidates to fulfill these needs. Um, and, you know, so contingency worker, in-house recruiter, I think that's really clear. And, you know, Kelly, um, for someone who's listening today and, you know, from the outside, there's always a bit of hesitation. What is the best way, according to you, for a job seeker to reach out to a recruiter mm -hmm. without appearing pushy or spammy? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, first and kind of getting back to when you're identifying, well, who, what kind of recruiter should I reach out to, too? And as you had mentioned with doctors, you know, it's not just a generalist. I would not advise working with a generalist. If you have a specialization in biotech or if you if your expertise is finance or technology, look for those recruiters that specialize in that particular area. Even with technology, I mean, it can break down very specifically to user experience and cybersecurity. So there's very particular areas of focus that these recruiters work with 
where they're working with companies that have those needs. So really, I mean, obviously I'm a LinkedIn you know, fanatic. So great resource to go in and do some keyword searches, use Google to identify agencies that might really specialize in your areas of expertise and reach out to those recruiters who specialize in your area. Now, needless to say too is, well, which one should I work with too? Yeah. Is, yeah. you know, I think that, you know, do your research. I, you know, I don't want to knock on younger recruiters because there's some phenomenal entry. Yeah. We all have to start somewhere. So, yes. right. So I would just take a look at maybe their tenure, how long they've been with the company. Are they working for a reputable company where they're getting great training? They have good mentorship. Um, I would also advise to ask your friends or your colleagues, Hey, what recruiters have you used that you've had success with? Um, it's just as, you know, if you're going to get you know, new carpet or a new kitchen done, you go ask for referrals of who did the work. So do the same when it comes to recruitment. Who have you worked with? Yeah. Um, as far in your quote, to answer your question too, about how to reach out to recruiters. And I, I see a lot of different things. And I think it's very important to be specific and to not be too demanding um, mm -hmm. when it comes to time. So mm -hmm. What I love to see is if it's an email or even if it's outreach through LinkedIn, it's just a quick, hi, Kelly, my name is Joe. I work with this company. These are my skill sets. This yeah. is what I'm looking for as far as titles, um, basic criteria as far as include what your salary target is, include what locations that you're open to. If you're only looking for remote, if you're open to going on site, these are just very check the box um, criteria yeah. that recruiters look for. And we can understand just real briefly what to contact you about. Um, include either a reference to your online presence, attach a resume if you see fit. Um, I would hope that good recruiters aren't going to be sending your resume to any organization without your consent. Um, certainly, if you feel that that's important to make clear, feel free to do that as well. Yeah. Um, no, that's I, great. That's great. I think that to put this in practice, I'm seeing a lot of specific questions. How do I do this? How do I do that? So just following um, Ariani, so following Kelly's advice and seeing the companies that you're interested in automobile, because that's huge, for example. Mm -hmm. And there you'll find a bunch of recruiters. Thanks to LinkedIn, you can do that for free. And then reaching out with a very specific ask. I think that's what I'm taking away. It's yes. not generic. It's not too demanding. And uh, the other thing I'm taking away is the more specialized your recruiter is, the better the chances of you know you forming a relationship. Even if they can't help you right now, but um, you have a certain skill set, they have a certain need, and it's always nice when they match as opposed to something very general, right? Yes. Um, when you're reaching out and there is, you know, like a cold, uh, a completely cold outreach, I think that's um, really, really useful. Um, okay. So, uh, and, you know, uh, Kelly, you spoke about being a LinkedIn fanatic. Now, as someone yes. who's an external recruiter, right, you're self-employed, yes. I'm guessing a uh, lot of talent, you're kind of like putting on like, this detective hat with your magnifying glass and you're looking at LinkedIn profiles. We talk about LinkedIn profiles so much here yes. on LinkedIn, Let's talk about meta. And also on my live stream with so many people, Kevin's one of the experts I've had twice. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, putting on the hat of your recruiter, you don't need to put on the hat, you are a recruiter. Uh, what are some of the things that you notice um, and you find important to you? Right. Okay. No, so in, and I'll put on my sourcing hat because I yes. do sourcing. I, yes. use, again, big, big fan of LinkedIn is we're using you know, optimize your profile so that yes. it can be identified by a recruiter. And the one of the easiest ways, plugging in keywords, right? So if it's hard skills or tech skills, particular software programs, or if it's a digital marketing skill like paid search or PPC, plug that in there into the summary, the experience. There's a skill section on the bottom that people can go endorse as far as skills specifically. So that's just a way as far as optimizing the profile. Of course, we're always using titles, right? And I know titles don't translate from company to company, but that's another area that we look for as well. Um, this 
probably is not popular advice. I think that we sync up on this a little bit, but I love a little bit of personality injected into the summary, just a little bit about you know why you got into what you did. And I think LinkedIn, well, there's a lot of argument, I think, about don't putting a lot of passion projects or your interests into the resume. I think LinkedIn is such a great area to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Inject some personality into your LinkedIn profile. I think um, all of those things that help you to be memorable mm -hmm. and not be yes. like everyone else. So I love that this is coming directly from a recruiter and not <laughs> from a fellow career coach or a resume writer, but someone who's... So in case anyone's wondering, the word, the key word that I heard Kelly use is sourcing. These are the people that the company goes to, people like Kelly, I need this position stat. It's always yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and people we like always. Kelly are like, okay, <laughs> challenge accepted, right? I'm mm -hmm. going to go find these people. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you've got your database, Kelly, I'm guessing, but you've also got LinkedIn and you've got other places. So it's like, okay, you person has done this. They have this experience. They have this qualification. All right, no problem. Nothing wrong with it. They've done this. They've done this. Ah, yeah. And they have this a little bit extra, whatever it is, a football fan or loves flying play. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> Some people say there's unnecessary information. I, I, I'm i completely with you, Kelly. A little extra that helps mm -hmm. you uh, to stand out a little bit, even if it's unrelated to the position, right? Yeah, absolutely. I was going to share, I mean, stories that there was a client yes, that I worked. Yeah, there's a, a client that I worked with that they did a lot of work with. Uh, kind of correlated to a food and, and farming. And there was a candidate that had a profile that she grew up on a farm and that really just stood out to the client. He was like, wow, that experience would just culturally be a great match to serve with my clients. So there's these interesting pieces of somebody's background, whether it's, you know, maybe music and maybe that's aligned with what the company might be producing or there's just small little things that I think yeah. is just a small slight edge over maybe some other, some other candidates that are just interesting. Now, it's not necessarily going to secure you the job, but it does make you stand out a little bit in terms of someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And um, I see a lot of questions, Kelly. So mm -hmm. I'm going to jump into the comments and see what's going on here. And if there are a few questions which are a little bit uh, not recruitment related, I'll go through mm -hmm. them a little quickly. So Nidhi, you've, you're uh, talking about moving jobs during a pandemic, during the initial phase, meaning when you start, right? So I'm going to go mm -hmm. through this one quickly and we I want to see other questions for Kelly. But uh, Nidhi, we talked about this a few times on my LinkedIn Live. And the acronym I love using is LOL. So listen, observe and learn the initial phases. Uh, it's um, one of those things where the company is deciding if they made the right decision by getting you on board. You're kind of finding your feet as well. It's a great time to be a sponge. I think that's the short answer. But you know, obviously, there's a detailed video on my YouTube channel. Feel, feel free to check it out. Okay. And I saw a couple of questions about MBA, um, soiling. Okay. The world is your oyster. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Absolutely. If you okay. haven't, yeah. Absolutely. I think so. And if there are project work, I know that there's a lot of the MBA programs that will hopefully start. I mean, actually, to be honest, it's just a great program to expand your network. Um, mm -hmm. I see you know, a lot of people who are finishing their MBA program and they just yeah. make really great contacts during that yes. time. So utilize that. Nurture, nurture mm -hmm. those contacts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and Kapil is saying, can we add retention bonus in our package while asking for a hike? Will the new recruiter take into consideration while calculating our existing or can we add retention, retention bonus, bonus in the package? Do, do, do you understand the question? So I think from what I'm understanding, and I've heard some organizations that are offering a retention, especially now. Um, yes. Because yes, the, the, your current employees for retention. The shizzle yes. has hit the fan and they're like, we don't leave, don't go. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's just a creative way that companies are adding to either put that into their package or again, I mean, if it's something that they can offer their current employees, then I'm all about creativity when it comes to an offer. So if that's an element, then. Uh, yeah, but I think Kapil, just be careful because retention bonus is a one-time thing. So if you want to add it to, in terms of, you know, like a negotiation, just mm -hmm. be careful with that, uh, that it, it doesn't sound, you know, misleading. And, right. and Jaydeep says, what do you think Kelly about the market currently for new, like fresh graduates? 
fresh graduates. Uh, it's it it's not terrible. I think that it just depends on, and it's about communicating your value. And I know that there are graduates that are coming out of school and they feel like they're at a disadvantage because they don't have the two or three years of professional experience that maybe some other people do. So this is when you really have to come in and prove your soft skills. Um, and that is, you know, I think kind of getting into that as far as what employers are wowed by is if it's anything that I'm going to say is the takeaway is the enthusiasm and passion. Yes. I can't tell you how many times I have worked with clients and this goes for new grads too, where they come in just anxious and hungry and they're demonstrating what they've been yep. doing as far as yep. upskilling or, you know, even picking up a project with a family friend and, and doing some basic maybe web design work or whatever it might be just to demonstrate that by action items that you've been doing, I think yes. is going to differentiate yes. that from the others. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, so don't underestimate the power of being hungry and, and enthusiastic and showcasing, you know, going out of your way to showcase your value uh, and not thinking of uh, the fact that you're a fresh graduate and that's a liability. It's actually an asset, depending mm -hmm. how you uh, use it. Absolutely. Uh, then I see another, uh, I love all these questions here. Mm -hmm. um, we have a salary related question. Sagarika, check out the video on my YouTube channel because this is specifically about uh, salary negotiation and that will help you. Um, Iris, yes, we're talking about different types of recruiters and staffing companies are mm -hmm. the external ones, right? Right. Correct. And um, then um, mm -hmm. if you are a specialist, find a specialist recruiter. What is the best way to reach out? Right. So I and I we discussed a little bit of this, but yeah. certainly through email, hopefully most recruiters include they should be hopefully easy to find um, through LinkedIn. I think I saw a stat of like 90, 95 plus of recruitment and HR are on LinkedIn. So hopefully they are on there. You can find them, reach out to them. You know, hopefully they even include an email. So you know, feel free to send through email. I know a lot gets lost in spam. My inbox yes. is buried in LinkedIn within a day too. So um, I would say use both channels again, you know, communicating who you are, what you're looking for, any criteria that's important to you. Um, and also if it is a larger company, or if you did see a specific position that you thought you would be a great fit for, do include the title and maybe just a link to the position. So the recruiter can refer to that in case that they have 30 recs and they're just not sure yeah, uh, what position that you're referring to. Yeah, I think that just to add to that, I think some people what they do is they want to, you know, spread, um, you know, make sure their bases are covered. So they will, if, if they, for example, if they want to reach out to me for anything, there will be an email, a Twitter DM, a, a LinkedIn mm -hmm. DM, a Instagram DM, uh, you name it, the same day. I think don't, don't do that. So I think <laughs> start with one, and wait for a few days if you don't and choose another and then choose another. But don't sort of smother. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily work. Um, and uh, Kelly, I'm getting a couple of other questions which are related to, you know, getting jobs for, you know, hiring international people. So just as an example, uh, Kelly, do you see um, the companies that you're working with? So this is a our, our session today is with Kelly, so I don't want to answer a generic answer, but, you know, um, our company is you know, opening up to sponsor difficult to find skill set. I think it depends. I should probably stay up on what the U.S. policy is right now, too. But I think for me, it just depends upon the company and if they're open to that or not. I do have clients that are completely on board with that. And then companies who maybe just aren't familiar with the process and just are a little hesitant. But I think that there are definitely organizations that are still open to hiring international, especially um, I know it's a little bit easier when they are on a, a student visa as well. Yeah, no. And Prashant, I think just going to your question, and we've talked about this uh, in the past as well. It's about having a very specific skill set, which is difficult to find. So if mm -hmm. a CIPD qualification is difficult to find in their local country, then they want to get someone from outside with okay. a specific skill set, right? So um, that should help. I think Nigel's asked a fantastic question. Mm -hmm. When a candidate asks a recruiter for feedback, do you ever pass on the really harsh negative feedback? So I will, I'll, with honesty, I will 
always give feedback. There is, and I'll be very honest, is sometimes there's some feedback that I'll receive that's more related to personality and behavior that's, that's tough. Um, and I really have to sit down and evaluate what will be communicated to the candidate. Um, you know, that you had a very boring personality is a really hard thing to communicate to someone. Um, of course, if it's coming down to another candidate and skills or anything related to just hard skills, um, somebody was stronger. And sometimes it is that. Sometimes there's just a stronger candidate in the running. And it, you know, I don't want to say it's anything about you, but it just comes down to somebody having more experience or just was more qualified for the role. But I will absolutely, all recruiters should be giving feedback about, yes, this is yes. why you're a good fit or no, this isn't why, but there yes. is. No sugar coating, um, give no. the facts. And, you know, people say brutally honest, more honest than brutal. Yeah, no, <laughs> there's a way, there's yeah. a way to do it. And not, um, every, not everybody receives feedback. Great. I've had, you know, I always will give feedback and people sometimes do tend to get upset. That doesn't sure. defer me from doing that, but not everybody enjoys receiving that type of feedback. No, as well. exactly. So if you ask for feedback, you can't have it both ways, right? If you ask mm -hmm. for feedback, be prepared for the answer. It's not right. always, you know, uh, honey and, and um, um, how did they say with Veronica? Sugar and spice and everything nice. Not always, right? No, not always. Some feedback is a bit hard to swallow. It's a hard pill to swallow. Yes. So I totally get that. And the topic of ghosting. Oh, my gosh, Kelly, what are people Steve. supposed to do? This is one of the reasons recruiters get a very bad yeah, rap. It is. Absolutely. And it's, it's not okay. And I, I know there's been a lot of conversation recently about, well, what is ghosting? What constitutes ghosting? And it happens full circle, right? But I think that if a recruiter, if a hiring manager, if there's actual communication, um, even email engagement and an interview specifically, and then somebody disappears, that is yes. ghosting. Now, yes. if somebody is applying to a job as an applicant, I wouldn't really consider that ghosting if there was really no two-way engagement. But as far as if a recruiter is not getting back to you, I would almost say try and maybe run it up the chain a little bit or maybe reach out. I mean, if you can to maybe reach out to, I don't want to say a supervisor, but if you are deep in the process, then I would engage with them. Um, if you've had some good communication with the person in the organization, a hiring manager, an interview, or I would, I would even maybe advocate to reach out to them as well. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think that, um, um, when there's a will, there's a way, but at some point, and, and like, uh, Kelly said, I I'm so glad you said that if you apply to a position and you get an automated response and you don't hear back from, for a month, leave it that, right. that doesn't mean anything, but we're talking about having invested multiple mm -hmm. rounds of time, you know, interviews with your time. And I have so many messages, Kelly, the person hasn't got back to me. What do I do? And, you know, they said the offer is coming. It's been two weeks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a question of having a balance between patience and um, frustration. Absolutely. <laughs> I know it's, it's sad. I see that it happened for weeks that, you know, I'm talking to these candidates and they're like, well, I've got to the final process and I'm reaching out to the recruiter and they haven't gotten back to me. And it's frustrating because you've invested a lot of time. You need some closure. So yeah, no, I totally get that. We are buried here in questions, Kelly. I'm not even <laughs> yeah. able to continue. So I'm going to quickly ask you before we uh, go with any more questions here. Talk to us about real life scenarios. You know, obviously <sighs> you can change the names of your clients and everything, yeah. but we want to know what is it that makes some candidates sail through interviews and other candidates completely bomb it. And you thought they had everything they needed. Mm -hmm. to sail through it. And you know, some good surprises, not so good surprises. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to start just a couple stories before even the interview. I'm going to start at the resume. Um, yep. Just a couple real quick things, just because real life it's happened and it's such an easy way to just do some correction to not make that happen. And I, whether I agree with it or not is a completely different conversation, but this is happening with business leaders who just pass. And so the big one is grammatical errors and spelling errors. I've had it happen at least two hands. Are you one of those people that cares about that? 
personally, I think that we're all human and we make mistakes, but I also think it's such an easy way to have everybody has like a grammar geek friend, right? Send that resume over. Just the best advice is give it to another set of eyeballs so they can look over it and pick those mistakes up because you don't want to let that be the reason. And also you have tools like Word document and Grammarly. These are a lot of them are free actually. Mm -hmm. So no excuses as such. Yeah. So just spell check the resume. Um, Okay. Also, and another, well, this will kind of come a little bit after too, but as far as after the interview is certainly follow up with a thank you email. I've seen that. I don't want to say take someone down, but I've seen a lot of conversation about who cares if you send a follow up. It shouldn't be. I've had many people where it's almost been many emails forwarded to me like, oh my gosh, look at this great email that they sent or I never heard from them. Are they even interested in the job? So there is no harm being done by sending a quick follow-up after the interview. Ideally, why not 24 hours? It doesn't need to be an essay. It can just be, you know, thank you for your time. Really appreciated learning about the company. If you forgot to mention something about a project that you did, or if they were interested in seeing more detail about a project or design work, include that in the follow-up as well. So I think that this is just a great opportunity. Never have I ever seen a client say, oh, I can't believe it. They sent me an email after the interview. That's terrible. Never, never mm-hmm. happens. No, no, that's, that's a great point. And, and uh, what about like, um, you sent a candidate over to your client, mm-hmm. prep them, everything's organized, they get there. And within a couple of hours, uh, the, cl- the candidate doesn't call you, the client calls you and says, Kelly, what were you thinking? <laughs> Has that happened? No, I never no. Uh, no, there is. And during the interview process, there's a lot that can, can go awry as well. And I think at the end of the day, a lot of it is just miscommunication. And you weren't able to communicate your value. And this can be an error on both sides where a lot of interviewers aren't trained to interview properly. They haven't vetted their interview questions. They're not asking the right questions. So sometimes the candidate has to steer it back on track to make sure that you're communicating the skills that are needed for the position and certainly understanding what that position is asking what is needed, what project work, what deliverables will be expected in the first three, three months. So you can address that specifically, um, share, share your stories. If you're not coming prepped with your success stories, you won't have an opportunity to convey that to them. They want to hear how you're going to basically be able to solve their problem. So giving yeah. examples of yeah. what you've done in the past. And I just see people just, you know, they, they don't do the prep work that they need to. They walk in, um, Confidence is a big thing too. Uh, I've heard many people say, well, you know, they looked unsure, which is okay. I mean, interviewing is a nerve wracking situation. It's it's not fun. I don't know anyone who says I love interviewing. (laughs) Neither the the recruiter nor the candidate. Right. No, it's It's a muscle. It's a muscle. Uh, Confidence is a muscle. I totally get that. Um, I love this question from Kevin and I've had so many opinions on it. Um, from so many people. Kelly, as a recruiter, what do you think about that green banner? On yes, I, I'll be curious to hear your opinion on this as well. I I go for it, honestly. Yeah. I mean, if you're judging someone because they have an open to work banner on their their profile, it's, it's so silly. And I think especially for um, recruiters or any any staffing professional who's even looking to bring somebody in on a like temp or very immediate basis. If they're open to work, they can most likely start tomorrow. So that's a great indicator. I know I had looked uh, about a year ago to find those banners because I know that most likely these candidates are ready to work most likely immediately. Um, I get that. But but Kelly, um, do you feel like when you see that banner, it actually is an advantage? Do you categorize them? I don't. And I know that I've, I've heard the opinion that some people think that banner shows that you're desperate, that there's no value add there. And I just don't agree with that. I just, I think it's a very judgmental mindset. Yeah. But Mm -hmm. the contrary of that, do you think that it's actually, um, when you see someone with a green banner, you actually jump and are like, Whoa, he's available. You know what I mean? Because it's not searchable. The code is not searchable, but 
otherwise when you're like oh it's uh, somebody i'm interested in. oh and they're green i'm going to yeah, reach right. out because they're green does that happen yeah i think so i've done it before i i've seen a banner i'm like oh they're open to work let me message them so and then your heart beats a little faster yeah no i know absolutely sometimes i don't okay. hear from them but uh, it's okay, okay. No, no okay. Think... That's good to know. I mean, we uh, when when we talk about it on the show, I think there's lots of people with lots of opinions. I personally feel like it's very distracting, so mm -hmm. I don't love it. I prefer instead the open to work tab below okay. the name, mm -hmm. uh, which says that open to recruiters, because that's I know is searchable. It comes up in the search results as opposed to it's a very personal preference type of thing. I don't think there's um, you know a, a right answer or a no. Wrong that's answer. true, and I. Probably to differentiate that too, because I don't even use a, a LinkedIn recruiter premium account. And while uh -huh. some recruiters do, is that we don't have access to when people check the box to open to work. So I personally use the sales navigator. I know yeah. a lot of recruiters that use that and find that to be a great resource. But yeah, the sales navigators, we don't get to see that. So uh -huh. um yeah. You know, okay. So you're aware to everyone out there that not everybody does, not all recruiters have access to that information. No, that's true. That's and it's also very expensive when you're self-employed, right? I think those type of talent solutions are targeting um, bigger companies. And speaking of companies, Antonio, this is a good question. I think mm -hmm. for this, maybe reach out to Kelly to have an opinion or check it out on Google <laughs> because today we're focusing on uh, job seekers. Um, I so Ira, we talked about what not to do as well. And I saw a question that I'm very curious to get your opinion on. Uh, it was a young guy. And if you're still around and you're watching, we're sorry, we're like drowning in questions, which is a yeah, great problem. No, we to need have. to address what not to do while reaching out, I think is a good question. I think it's just um, kind of expecting outreach from the recruiter is once they leave the ball in their court, if they feel, hopefully if there's an interest or they do see that your skills or background are aligned, they will reach out to you. Um, but even maybe highlighting a couple times as far as this is my availability, feel free to reach out at these times um, is a great, I think, area to approach as opposed to call me today at 1 p.m. Yeah, 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 totally get that. Um, this is an interesting question. I'm a 23 year old and I have premature premature gray hair. I don't want to dye my hair, oh, right? No. Um, does this affect the person? What do you think, Ellie? Oh, gosh, I would yeah. hope not, but I mean, I there's a lot of bias and discrimination yeah. out there, so I can't speak on behalf of everything will be peachy keen. I, I would hope for your sake that you wouldn't want to work for an employer that did discriminate against that yeah no i i agree i think saurabh you do you yeah you don't want to die don't die it. there's no pressure women feel a lot of it so you kind yeah. of have an idea of what we go through mm -hmm. there's um you know focused on the job and the position and the skills and the issues as opposed to the appearance mm -hmm. right Absolutely. so um makes perfect sense um then i saw let's see there was a question uh that 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 if you see something that you know okay. um let me know because i'm like oh. yeah absolutely I'm, I'm focused on questions right now as opposed to yeah i mean i can even i mean as far as some other silly reasons that candidates have been passed on i mean as a recruiter who's doing a lot of work in tech and and hard skills is that i'm seeing a lot of people say oh i'm well versed in these skills and then going into the interviews and completely bombing um, the tech tests, which, I mean, I remember 10 years ago, there was a developer who went into a, a tech interview and the business leader peeked in and he was copying and pasting open source code into a, a tech test that was being delivered. So what? yeah, he was caught. Um, he had made it years and years as, as a developer as well. But I think when you're going into these roles and saying, oh, well, you know, I'm a proficient in Drupal or whatever it might be that expect that at some point you might be pressure tested a little bit on those tech skills. Yeah. Yeah. Totally get that. Um, all right. So let's see a uh, question. Yeah. If HR is deliberately delaying in processing, you know, in uh, India, it's called the full and final settlement. So, you know, you're about okay. to uh, resign the exit process. 
that's unpleasant mitesh so i totally understand that what other mm-hmm. options other than reminder emails or phone call i think mitesh this is going to sound a bit ugly i don't know i just think maintain a tra- you know a uh, paper trail uh, of everything that you're doing and unfortunately some companies do this it's a very ugly practice they are delaying and paying you what they owe you right mm. so just keep it at hand and then um let them know that hey listen the last thing i want to do is is go out on social media and talk about it i really want to end this properly um mm. uh, but i don't know i i, I wouldn't necessarily uh, go too much into it we're already like 40 minutes into this and we're like whoa so many more questions uh and then nigel says hey you know uh many times recruiters say it's the employer that hasn't passed on the feedback um the the client so mm-hmm. is there any threshold under which employers will not give feedback and you know is that the only time employers withhold feedback it's also the legal implications yeah, right that's I unpleasant that there could be some and that kind of gets back to some of the feedback that i've received from like oh that's like you know a court case right there if that was actually communicated at the end of the day so i think a lot of these corporations that might not pass uh back feedback is because of the the bias or discrimination that is involved yeah. with that yeah no i i understand that <laughs> geez like green batter no <laughs> it's, uh, it's a personal yeah, it's, it's a, a personal preference opinion yeah for sure it's, yeah i i think it, it's about what works for you mm-hmm. so um aryani is asking about changing industries and and mm-hmm. kelly what are your advice specifically for the resume part you know she's coming from uh, i'm guessing heating ventilation air conditioning i'm guessing that's what h h v a c stands for and uh wants to go into automobile which is again a heavy industry right what mm-hmm. what tips can you help her with for her resume to be seen as you know something interesting and not tossed into the reject pile right absolutely i think when it comes to and i'm definitely not a career coach by any means but i think that when you're moving from industry is of course if you can gain any industry experience if it's apprenticing or getting an internship in that industry fantastic but in the meantime it's more of drawing out those transferable skills that you had learned through hvac um in basically highlighting those and how they apply to the new industry so communication skills critical thinking problem solving those are all highly sought skills so if you can extract that from what you've been doing and showcase that um that's a great way to hopefully yeah, yeah. move to the next Aryani I would say definitely and just you know look at one or two stories which will translate into the automobile mm-hmm. and have those on the ready in your resume as well as for your interviews uh seasoned rich this this word makes me laugh it makes oh. me think of people like barbecue meat i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't like the word it's another way of saying you know hey um i'm qualified i'm experienced that's fine i'm seasoned and they seem to want young ones What do you yeah. what do you say to that Kelly? Well, I that know can, I, I um, was having a conversation with someone yesterday who was very frustrated and was being passed on by somebody who was 15 years younger, probably could have been brought in for half the price she felt and I mean it can happen. I think that you know, again, we have a lot of this bias and discrimination and I think it's a lot about hopefully being able to again focus on our value and how that's an asset like you're getting more um leadership experience and team building experience and there's so much more that the seasoned uh professionals can bring to the table um sometimes it is you know i'm seeing a lot and i think some of the skills that i'm seeing now that are in demand is a lot of the companies do need a lot of the tactical implementation um to come in and basically do the actual building and i think a lot of the professionals eventually kind of move away from that and you know still is filling this huge void in the market right now yeah and i think rich i don't know this is a little unconventional but um i talked about ageism a lot and and we've done it on live streams i think anything that you feel is um blindly quietly uh, being held against you i would bring it up mm. on like the first thing i wouldn't necessarily mm-hmm. wait for a rejection like hey i know what you're thinking <laughs> no, i don't know i feel like in the past if the things haven't worked then it's time to change things a little bit and and do it differently and like i'll these are the three reasons where i can tell you i'm still way better i got so much in me i got 
years of work experience left. We're going to work till we're 70, 75. It's just the way we, just the way our, our biology is. And these are the reasons why I'm, I'm better than anyone else out there. You need to have confidence. It's not easy uh, to come up with that without being arrogant. Um, and this will be not for everyone, right? Some will not mm-hmm. like it. Some will like it. You want to focus on the ones that so you true. want to attract because you yes. can't, you can't control everything. Um, yes. And there was something about the U.S. market, and I'm, yeah, okay, in the North American job market, this is a big question, it's covered up half your face. <laughs> uh, so what is your recommendation? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Ravindra, can you can you make your question short? Because I'm not able to follow. I feel like you've... Um, uh i'm i've missed i'm not okay. able to translate that so make it a little in your questions guys i would just request you to keep it short and simple that it doesn't like cover up the whole screen because yeah, it's, uh, I don't it's know for, you know jack of all it, trades yeah and also <laughs> yeah, answering it live right yeah 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 um mm-hmm. and then there was a question about you know how do you handle illegal questions uh you know, it's a lot of uh, unhappy people when it comes to things like, yes, salary negotiation. How do you avoid stuff like last drawn salary, you know, when you're attending the interview? And, you know, you know, you're on the lower side, mm-hmm. um, Kelly. Uh, and, you know, whether they are supposed to ask you or not, you don't want to answer it. So do you right. have any specific tips for that? Mm. Yeah, I mean, especially in the U.S. now, I think there's 20 states where it's illegal to ask, yes. what is your current salary? So, um, you know, I've still have a couple business leaders that really like to know, well, what are they earning now? And I'm like, that's illegal. We can't ask that anymore. Um, But I think that, you know, if you can go back to doing your research, because there are a lot of professionals who are underpaid and they know that, and they don't want to disclose that and be taken advantage of again. So I think it's hopefully really smart to go out there and, and do some research on salary.com, I guess is a great one. LinkedIn has a couple salary tools as well and kind of keep an open band as far as this is what I'm targeting. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And Prakash, check out my YouTube channel. I have a video on how to answer a question that you don't want to answer. <laughs> I, okay. I have a specific <laughs> script that you can feel free to copy. And and uh, Kelly, there's some questions about resumes and things like length and you know, text format versus uh, PDF uh, pictures. I think, I don't know, we, I don't know where you're based, but in most cases, I think it's safe to assume that without a picture is better. Um, in some parts of the world, it's okay. But in the US or Nordic countries, exactly. it's a complete no-no. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, things like one page, two page. Do you have any opinions on that? You know, I don't want to read an eight page resume, but no. I one page, two page, three page. I am a big content over size, length, yes. fonts. I mean, unless it's very Quality. hard to read. Yes. You know, don't squeeze everything into one page. I mean, you can tell when people are really trying to, you know, this font size is like eight and it's hard to, you know, you need a magnifying glass out. So feel free to make it too. I mean, especially, you know, people who have more experience, that experience is going to kind of trickle over into more pages. So don't feel like you need to keep the resumes to one page, even two. Yeah, it, it's always quality over quantity, right? Yes, so it makes sense. Absolutely. So our friend has come back to us and he says, what if I have multi-industry cross-function and more specialty we'll exposure? As on the contrary, the North American market looks for a very okay. focused and very specific, um, and and his is more broad, I guess. Um, okay. Any, any tips for that? Yeah, and I think that this kind of gets back to kind of the silly. Actually, this is a, a good story as far as silly reasons that candidates are passed on, and this is more so if you find a, it, it's building a target list and identifying the positions that you're targeting. So if you consider yourself a generalist, a jack or Jill of all trades. You really need to focus on if you're applying for a position to really draw out those skills if you are a generalist that apply specific to that role. So um, I'm not saying that you really need to tailor every single resume, but switch some things out like a summary section. It's so easy to replace summary with the target title of the job that you're applying for. And then a couple achievements that really show that you can solve the problem of what they're potentially looking to solve in that company. So um, I've seen, you know, seen people go into interviews and they come out and I get a call from the client saying, yeah, they kind of just look like they want any job and not this job. And I think that you really need 
to think about focus and what you're looking to achieve. And it's okay if maybe you're not necessarily sure. Sometimes I do have clients where they see skills and, and they have the idea that, oh, you know what? You might actually do well in this department or do that. But hopefully make them come to terms with that before you coming in and saying, hey, I'm ready to do anything, um, unless they really propose that first. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's sage advice. I think that makes perfect sense. Um, and um, let's see if uh, I missed. I've got flies in this room. It's very annoying. Uh, <laughs> talk about uh, the trends in the market today. Yeah. And, you know, talk to us about certain, um, you know, skill sets that your clients are hungry for, mm -hmm. but you're not able to keep up because you see the demand, but you don't see enough supply. Anything like yeah. that? Isn't it? It's everything right now. Um, <laughs> I know. So I'm, and I can probably only speak on behalf of my area, which is again tech and digital marketing. I mean, I think yes. obviously the pandemic shifted things a little bit in regards to digital transformation, acceleration, and even marketing. When event marketing, the rug was pulled out underneath due to pandemic. So a lot of people had to shift those marketing dollars over into digital spend. So we're still, and even before the pandemic, was seeing a really strong need and demand for digital marketing. So a lot, I mean, a lot of paid search, um, still a little bit of SEO, a lot of those hard tech skills, software engineering, yeah, I can't remember a time when I have been in recruiting when development engineering has not been in demand. So I think that that's been a very steady need as well. I mean, and again, thinking that as you move on in your career and you gain more experience, that it's going to take a little bit longer to find those positions just due to, to demand and so I think that if you are more at an executive level, that you should expect to take a little bit more time to find that right need uh, and good fit. Um, I'm seeing a lot as far as tech skills, analytics, um, all the way up to higher end of gathering those insights, storytelling with that data. That's been a really big yeah. demand as well. Um, I've heard recruiting is in demand. I mean, due to yeah. the talent market. To get all these recruiters. people, right? They yeah. need recruiters, trained, trained recruiters. Yes, absolutely. There's a big gap in the market there. Um, um, and, you know, for these type of demanded jobs, particularly, right, Alex is asking, where do you see the whole relocation? Do you see companies willing to uh, bring a candidate from a different city or a different state or even a different country? I think now that they I've been seeing some companies that are open to relocation, I think because of the, the sector that I work, technology and digital marketing, obviously, the companies are just being more flexible with offering fully remote now. Um, so that obviously changes the land. I mean, I've always been so ingrained here in the DMV that it winds a larger net for me to go look for talent nationwide as well. And then candidates are like, well, I can go look in Boston or I can go look, you know, in the Midwest. So I think that that's from a remote perspective, really changing a lot. And we're obviously seeing that whole dynamic and shift. But I have had clients say, if we find the right candidate, we are open to relocating them. Yeah. Ah, that's good. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly as things are opening up right now, um, that makes a lot of sense. I am seeing so many questions on salary negotiation, <laughs> salary. last drawn salary. Can we negotiate if you've never worked? Guys, I'm going to have to um, end it because uh, <laughs> I'm going to be just as FYI, I'm going to be releasing a video on salary negotiation in a week's time on, on YouTube. So and in the meantime, there's a lot already in there and some questions on resume, which we already went through. So if you're joining us now, make sure you watch the replay. So I think um, we're coming close to an hour and so much time has gone by. We didn't even like realize how fast I know I had more Kelly. stories to tell oh my god <laughs> okay. um so, so you know your favorite because I just want to quickly uh make sure you you are aware of Kelly's profile make sure you follow her on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and if you're a somebody like I think it was Antonio who watching and interested in working with a recruiter definitely check out her website knackdigital.com um mm -hmm. and uh, so we spoke about so many different things, right? If you're joining us late, we talked about different types of recruiters and which are the ones you need to focus on, particularly with your, um, you know, skill set and how they can help you. Because at the end of the day, that's why you're watching. And we talked about real, you know, stories of, of 
how things go well for a candidate and how they don't uh different uh, ways uh different ways of reaching out to a recruiter how do you follow up what if you don't get feedback what if you get harsh feedback we talked a lot about that market trends um you hear this you heard this directly from a recruiter there is no problem inject a little personality into your resume into your linkedin she has no problem with the little green banner says that says <laughs> open to work and, and it's helpful in fact she says it's helped helps to see you know um, people stand out um and any last words uh kelly uh before we uh, wrap up yeah i would just like to say recruitment gets a bad rap and you know as any profession i think that there's great ones and there's not so great ones so just do your due diligence look at you know do some research try to form long lasting relationships, because at the end of the day, I mean, I've had relationships with people. I've placed them numerous times over my career. I think the end game is they're another tool in your toolkit for networking. So yeah. they're not the end all be all, but please integrate them into your job search strategy. Yeah. 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 No, that's true. And you don't want to think of recruiters only when you need them, mm -hmm. but also throughout the year, you know, Hey, Christmas card, how are you doing? Uh, that's, that's a great strategy. And that always comes in handy. Mm -hmm. So um, all those watching on YouTube, if you have questions that have not been answered, please put them not in the chat, but put them in the comments section uh, because I'll do my best to answer you and, and same for uh, LinkedIn as well. So if you could just give it a, a, a applause for uh, Kelly for being with us today and giving us uh, an hour of her time uh -huh. with so much wonderful advice. I want to say a huge thank you to Kelly oh, and thank you for having you. me. It's been oh, so fun. Of course, <laughs> of course, definitely. And and thanks to everyone for being here today uh, and uh, take care of yourselves. Have a lovely weekend and see you next Friday. I'll be on and I will not be having a guest. So bring in all your questions related to jobs, careers. I'll, I'll do my best to answer you live. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye for now.